<clears throat> Alrighty, now we're going to talk about uh, matrix inverses or what it means to be the multiplicative inverse of a matrix. Here we specifically are talking about square matrices. So if a matrix has an inverse, we'll find out that not all matrices do. Um, they, it necessarily is a square matrix. So here we're going to look at A. We'll call this an N by N square matrix. And A is said to have an inverse if there exists a matrix. We're going to call this A. And then we'll, it'll look like it's raised to the negative first power. We don't mean one over A, we mean A inverse here. Um, so if there exists um, a matrix A inverse such that A A inverse is equal to A inverse A, which is equal to the identity matrix here. And not only is this an if here that I've stated up here, this is an if and only if. Okay. And so this is the only criteria for us to have an inverse. And if we have an inverse, if A has or admits an inverse, so if a inverse exists, we say A is invertible. And we'll see what we mean or why we call this invertible later. Um, but really, it, it kind of plays into why A inverse is an inverse. Um, and we'll notice that if we take the product A, A inverse, and we get an N by N identity matrix, this means that A inverse is also an N by N matrix. Okay, so what we have here is a matrix A inverse such that when you multiply it on either side, right, the side matters here. When you multiply it on either side, what you get is the identity. This is parallel to, so what did we have for the additive inverse? Right, for the additive inverse, we had a matrix A and then its inverse was negative A because that gave us the zero matrix, right? We also have a multiplicative now. Inverse. Because we have A times A inverse. This is the identity matrix. Here, remember zero was the additive identity. Right? If you take A plus zero, you still get A. Here, I sub n is the multiplicative identity. Because if you take A times I, you still get A, right? And so this idea of inverse um, is always the same, but the elements themselves change, right? So here, our inverse was something that once we add, to A, we get the additive identity. And now the multiplicative inverse, A inverse, is something that when you multiply it to A, you get the multiplicative identity, right? And so we now have this kind of parallel here between additive and multiplicative um, identities and inverses, but they're, they're inherently different. Um, I want to discuss and even prove the following theorem for a matrix A, if A inverse exists, then it is unique. 
Meaning if there were to exist some other matrix B such that, so let's say IE, in other words here, if there exists a matrix B such that, remember that backwards E stands for there exists, such that A, B equals B, A equals the identity, well then that would simply mean that B equals A inverse. And let's find the proof of this, um, or let's see if we can prove this, prove uniqueness of a multiplicative identity. Well, let's just start with assuming that there does exist. So let's assume there exists a B such that A, B equals B, A equals the identity matrix, right? Well, then let's just start with A inverse. We know by the properties of the multiplicative identity that this is the same as A inverse times I here, right? But now by our assumption, we have that a, b is equal to i. And so what we could do is replace this i sub n with a, b, right? Just using this equality um, of our assumption. Well, then we can use the associative property of matrices and say, this is a inverse a times b. But now we know that a inverse times a is the identity matrix on b. And then we know B times the identity is just B. And so we've seen, if you were to assume there exists some other matrix B that would act as an inverse to A, well, this string of equalities here shows us that this was actually just A inverse already. Um, so we now have uniqueness of, of an inverse. Let's, let's look at an explicit example here. So if we had, Let's just start with a two by two matrix. Let's say A is the two by two matrix one, 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 two. And let's show that the matrix two, negative one, negative one, one is the inverse of A, right? And so what do we need to do? Well, what we need to do is we need to show, so we want, to show that one, 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 two times two, negative one, negative one, one equals zero, right? This is what we're trying to, or excuse me, I'm stuck on uh, additive identity. We wanna show that this is equal to one, zero, zero, one, which is also I two, right? This is what we need to show. So to verify that two negative one, negative one, one is an identity, well, then it suffices to compute this matrix multiplication. And so if we compute the matrix multiplication here, we have two negative one, and then we'll go times, uh, basically, again, what we're doing is we're taking the dot product of the vector two negative one with the vector one, one. And if we did that, we would have two minus one, which is one. And then we would take the dot product of negative one, one with one, one. And you can see we'd have negative one plus one is zero. And then we could do the same thing, right? Two negative one with one, two, that's gonna be two minus two, which is zero. And then for the last one, we would have negative one, one dot product with one, two, that would be negative one plus two would be positive one. And so we verified that this is this matrix here, A inverse is indeed the inverse of the matrix one, 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 two. Now, I've mentioned a few times, but not spoken to really, the fact that not all matrices admit an inverse. You'll see I'm using this terminology like if a matrix inverse exists or if, this exists, it's invertible, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd like to use an example to convince you that not every matrix admits an inverse. And so we really do need to stipulate 
or um, understand that when we talk about these properties of inverses, well, it's only in, in the facts or insofar as they exist. And so let's look at the matrix A equals one, 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 one. And we'll ask ourselves, does there exist A inverse, right? This would be how we would ask this question. Well, let's assume it does. Let's assume A inverse exists. Then let's give them, let's give the entries some names, right? Because if it exists, we're trying to solve for, for what this matrix is. So let's give these, um, let's say A, B, C, and D here. And let's say we're trying to solve for A, B, C, and D. Well, how would we go about doing this? Well, we would need to set up that A times this inverse, so one, 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 times this inverse A, B, C, D. We would need this to necessarily be equal to I2, right? This would need to be equal to one, zero, zero, one. Well, if we do this, let's compute the matrix multiplication on the left-hand side first, and then we can equate it to I2 on the next page here. So if we do matrix multiplication here, we're going to get in the first entry, it's going to be A plus C, and then B plus D, and then A plus C, and again, B plus D, right? We can see that by just computing the matrix multiplication here. And so now we have that, let's copy this, A plus C, A plus C, B plus D, B plus D. Well, this is now equal to one, zero, zero, one, if this exists, right? And we're saying, we're assuming this exists, this inverse. And so we're assuming that this should necessarily be equal. But now let's equate the first columns. If we equate the first columns, then we have that A plus C equals one in the first entry, and then A plus C equals zero in the second entry. Well, a quick substitution would yield one equals zero. And since this is a contradiction, this means that our assumption was faulty and therefore A inverse does not exist, right? Or if you would like, this was kind of like a limit notation for limits not existing. If you would like kind of a more modern, if you will, um, or a more current uh, description, you would say there does not exist, right? This backwards E with a slash through it, right? If the backwards E means there does exist, then the slash included means there does not exist an A inverse for A equals one, 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 one. Okay, and so here's an example of a matrix that doesn't have an inverse, even though it is a square matrix. And now this method though, is even though we went through this example and found that this matrix doesn't have an inverse, this method is um, a pretty good method for finding the inverse in general. So what we could do here is let's start with another example. Let's say A equals one, 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 two. And what we wanna do is find the inverse if it exists. Okay. And so what would we do here? Well, let's do the same thing. Let's assume it exists. Let's assume A inverse equals, and we could say like X, Y, Z, W here, right? Well, then if this inverse exists, we would necessarily have that one, 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 two times the inverse X, Y, Z, W equals one, zero, zero, one, right? The same process here. This assumption would lead to the following. Well, if we do matrix multiplication on the left-hand side, we're going to get, well, for the first column, we're gonna get two equations, right? We're gonna get X plus Z um, equals one. And then we're going to get X plus two Z equals zero. You can see that, right? And then for the second column, we're going to get two equations as well. We're gonna get Y plus W equals zero. 
and y plus 2w equals 1, right? This would just be from the matrix multiplication. If you would like to multiply these two things out first, well, what you would get is you would get x plus z for the first entry, y plus w for the second, and then you would get um, x plus 2z and y plus 2w, right, after you do that multiplication, and then we're assuming this to be equal to 1, 1, 1, 0, then looking at the first column, again, like I was saying here, if you equate the first columns here, you get this system. If you equate the second columns here, you get this system. Now, solving these two systems of equations is equivalent to the existence of an inverse. So let's do that, right? We could set up an augmented matrix for this first system in blue here. That would be for X and Z. We have the following system. It was one, 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 two, one, zero. And then for the second system, right? For just Y and W, we would have one, 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 two, zero, one. And notice, how, maybe I'll use gray here. Notice how in both cases, this is just the matrix A again. And that's interesting that we get A back in that. Um, I wanna mention that now and then we'll address it later. So solving these systems, we would want to put the left-hand side, we wanna get this augmented matrix into reduced row echelon form, right? And so for the first one, you could do this by taking, um, well, let's say row two is replaced with row two minus row one. This would give us one, 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 and then row two minus row one. So that'd be zero, two minus one would be one, zero minus one would be negative one, right? And then we would need to get rid of, so we put this in row echelon form by, row two minus row one, and now we need to get rid of this entry here. So let's say row one is now equal to row one minus row two. If we do that, then we're gonna get uh, one, zero, and then we're gonna have one minus negative one. So that's two, and then we have zero, one, negative one, right? Putting this in reduced row echelon form, this tells us here, right? This information tells us that it looks like x is 2 and z is negative 1. And so what we could do is go back to our inverse here, and we learned that x and z are 2 and negative 1, and now we're solving for y and w, right? We would do the same thing to this second uh, system here. And for the sake of time, right, we're, we're comfortable with this by now, what you would get is one, zero, zero, one, and then negative one, one. This would tell you that uh, y equals negative one and w equals one. Putting this all together here, I'll remind us that A was the matrix one, 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 two, and putting everything we found solving this system here, we learned that the inverse is two, negative one, negative one, one. And you could verify this fact by multiplying these together and seeing if you get the identity, the, um, excuse me, the identity matrix. And now we, we go back to, to looking at, well, why did we compute these, right? If in both cases of this augmented matrix, if we had A both times here, then why did we compute these systems separately? And that's a good question to ask. You can combine this and it becomes much more efficient. And this turns into um, an algorithm actually for computing the inverse. But in this particular example, what we could have done was we had A on the left-hand side, right? Of these both augmented matrices, we had A, but now let's augment these at the same time. And so now basically what we have is, if I can write up a little bit, what we've started with is A augment I2, right? You can see that's what we've started with. 
And now if you were to put this in uh, this augmented matrix, this two by four matrix into reduced row echelon form, what you would get, and you can verify this, is you would get one, zero, zero, one, you would get the identity on one side and then two, negative one, negative one, one. And you should verify this. And what we get here is an algorithm. What we started with was A, I, two, and then what we ended up with was I, two, A, inverse here. And so this idea of using row operations to start with A, augment I2 and end up with I2 augment A inverse, this is um, something that you can do algorithmically to if, if you can get kind of from point A to point B here, well, then that means that the inverse exists and these row operations spit out exactly what that inverse needs to be. So let's write down um, this, this algorithm here. So here's an algorithm for finding an inverse. Okay, so step one, well, let's prerequisite, let's add some prerequisite information here. So let's let A be an N by N matrix. And now to find A inverse, we start by forming form the augmented matrix A, I sub N. The second step here would be to row reduce to I N B here. And then if step two is possible, then the resulting matrix B is the inverse. If two is impossible, then A is not invertible, meaning the inverse doesn't exist, right? And so here's our algorithm for calculating the inverse of a matrix. And I'd like to do um, an example here so we can kind of see how this works out for maybe a little more of a non-trivial example. Okay, so let's look at a three by three example. Let's find A inverse if it exists for the following matrix, A equals one, two, two, one, zero, two, three, one, negative one. Okay, so what was step one of our algorithm here? Well, it was to form A augmented with the proper identity matrix. So here we have one, two, two, one, zero, two, three, one, negative one, augmented with one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one. Okay, and now step two is we need to start performing row operations to try to get the identity matrix on the left-hand side. And basically what this is doing is we're trying to put this in reduced row echelon form. So I can do a few steps at once here. We can, we understand that when we're trying to put this in reduced row echelon form, what we need to do first is make th this entry and this entry uh, zero, right? And we can do that at the same time. So let's say row two is being replaced with row two minus row one. And then row three is being replaced with row three minus three row one. If we do that, then we're going to get one, two, two, one, zero, zero. And then we'll have one minus one is zero, zero minus two is negative two, two minus two is zero, zero minus one is negative one, one minus zero is one, zero minus zero is zero. And then for the third row, we would have three minus three is zero, uh, one minus six is negative five, negative one minus 
six is negative seven. Zero minus three is negative three. And then zero minus zero is zero. And one minus zero is one, right? And so we've done two steps here to getting this into a reduced row echelon form. Let's keep going. Now we need to get rid of this negative five, right? Because we're taking all the entries below the pivot positions and we're doing row operations to turn these into zeros. And so from here, we can get rid of this if we do row three is equal to, is replaced with row three minus five halves row two, right? You can see there. And if we do this, what we will get is the following matrix. We'd have one, two, two. We did nothing to the first row, right? And we've done nothing to the second row. Negative one, one, zero. And then the third row, then zero. And if you look here, we would have negative five plus five, which would be zero. And then we'll get negative seven, negative one half, negative five halves and one, right? You can, you can verify this. Um, the right-hand side is easy. The only other thing you would have to look at is this negative seven there, right? Um, okay. So what, what are we doing now? Well, now we need to get this. It's in, well, it's almost in row echelon form. The diagonals aren't all ones, right? The pivot, the pivot positions don't all have um, an entry of one, but we can do that later. Um, what we need to do now is start getting the entries above pivot positions turned into zeros, right? So let's turn this two into a zero next. And so how can we do that? Well, we can do that by saying row one is replaced with row one plus row two. And if we do that, we're gonna get one, zero, we'll have two plus zero is two, one plus negative one is zero. And then zero plus one is one, zero, and then nothing else changed. Zero, zero, negative seven, negative one half, negative five halves, one, right? And now we need to get this last um, two, we need to get this turned into a zero. But first, let's go ahead and put this in um, row echelon form. And so I'll divide through everything here. Um, so let's take row two is going to be negative one half row two. And then row three is going to be negative one seventh row three. If we do that, and I think I'll go to the next page here. What we're going to get is one, zero, two, zero, one, zero, and then zero, one, zero, one half, negative one half, zero, 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 one, one fourteenth, five fourteenths, negative one seventh, not seventeenth, negative one seventh, right? And this was just from these two multiplying row two and row three by the respective scalars. And now it looks like with one more step here, we can get this to where the left-hand side is the three by three identity matrix, right? And so we can obtain that by saying row one is going to be row one minus two row three. This gives us one zero zero and then row one. So it looks like we're gonna have zero minus one is going to be, um, or excuse me, we're gonna have zero minus one seventh. So negative one seventh. And then it looks like we'll have one minus 10 over 14. That's gonna be two sevenths. And then we're gonna have zero plus two sevenths. That's two sevenths. And then the other rows remain unchanged. So one half, negative one half, zero, and then we have zero, zero, one, one fourteenth, five fourteenths, 
and negative one seventh. And now what we have is this was through the second step of the algorithm, right? We've now by row reduction, we started with the identity on the right hand side of the augmentation. And after all these uh, row reductions and elementary row operations, we now have the identity on the left hand side. And this tells us that A inverse is the matrix negative one seventh, two sevenths, two sevenths, one half, negative one half, zero, one fourteenth, five fourteenths, negative one seventh, right? And so you can see calculating an inverse um, is not always as trivial as kind of some of the, the first examples we did. And so we need this, this algorithm here again to, to be able to, to solve for the inverse when it exists. And remember, if we were going through all these real operations and this wasn't possible, say we couldn't get this all the way down to the identity matrix here, well, then that inverse doesn't exist, right? And so that's worth keeping in mind there. Um, I think I'm going to stop here and I'm actually going to have a third part for today's lecture. It's a little more lengthy than I wanted, so I apologize for that, but I do think taking the time to go over examples in depth is hopefully worth the time uh, and will increase your understanding. And so in the third video here, I'm, I'm hoping to make it much shorter, what I'll do is talk about how we can solve a system of equations by solving um, for the inverse of a matrix. And then I also want to cover some properties and then briefly discuss what an elementary matrix is. We won't talk about elementary matrices all that much, but it will be um, something that we do want to, to know what it is and, and be able to use elementary matrices. So there will be a quick third part video um, after this, and then that will wrap up the first week of lecture.